Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. It's time for another video and in this one we're looking at how you inside of Orchestrator can add a lot of flexibility to how jobs are processed when they are running as a result of a queue based trigger. It's a little bit advanced. It might even be a little bit boring, but it adds so much flexibility. So you should really watch to the end. So let's get to it. So if you're like me, you've probably built a ton of processes that run off of a queue. So if you use a robotic enterprise framework, you have a queue and you have a trigger and, and the trigger simply fires whenever something is put into the queue and then it runs until the queue is empty. And that's all well and good, but sometimes it isn't. Because sometimes, somehow, a lot of queue items show up in your queue or maybe stuff happens that makes the processing of each individual queue item uh, slow. And so the process will run for maybe hours or even days and you don't want that. At least you want some control over that. So uh, there are some options inside of Orchestrator that can help with that situation. And we'll take a look at those now. So let's jump into Orchestrator. So inside my Orchestrator here, we can see in the shared folder, we have one process. It's called My Process. This is just a dummy process. We're not actually going to run anything in this video. And then in the uh, queues tab over here, we have one queue called My Queue. And if we go back to the Automations tab and into the Triggers uh, page, we can see that we don't have any triggers configured yet. So let's add a new queue based trigger. And we'll do that by clicking the add new trigger button up here. And we will call the trigger. We'll just call it my trigger, just to keep it simple. And then uh, we'll need to select what process this trigger needs to run when fired. And that is, of course, the my process process. The account and machine is always the same in my videos. It's any user, any robot account, and any machine, because I only have one of each. So it's pretty simple. And then uh, up here in the queue selection box, we need to select which queue is it that we want to trigger or to fire this trigger. And of course, that is the my queue queue. So for this video, the interesting stuff is really at the top uh, part of the right side here. And the first one, minimum number of items to trigger the first job. Well, that simply defines how many items need to be put into the queue before you trigger the first job. And by default, this is set to one. So anytime anything is put into the queue, this trigger will fire and run the process. But you don't always want that to happen because sometimes there's a lot of overhead in starting a process. You need to start up applications, you need to shut them down again. And maybe for some reason you want the process to run whenever there's only a certain number of queue items. This could be for reporting purposes and stuff like that. So maybe you want to set this to a higher number. We can set it to five. And now if we add four items to the queue, the trigger is not going to fire. But if we add five items, funny enough, then it will fire. So that's the first one. Maximum number of pending and running jobs allowed simultaneously. That's a, a funny one. That's something you use if you want to scale out the execution of this process horizontally, or at least scale it out to more than one robot. It doesn't make sense to change this number to more than one if you only have one robot machine. Because if it creates two jobs, well, the first job is going to run until the queue is empty. So nothing more is going to happen, right? So you want to do this if you want to split the number of queue items between um, several machines, right? So basically here we have a, a robot, right? And we have a single process, process A. We also have a queue with a number of queue items in it. Now, whenever we fire process A using a queue trigger, what happens is process A is going to execute a number of times and process each queue item in sequence until it's done. And it's going to take a little bit of time because there's only one process, there's only one machine, but there's a ton of queue items, right? So it takes a bit of time. And in our case, let's say this takes 90 minutes to process these queue items. It's a bit longer than what we want, really. So uh, what if we had another robot machine? So now we have robot one, robot two, both can run process A and both have queue triggers configured to uh, run when something is added to our queue. So what's going to happen here is each of them is going to process items, not in turn, but in parallel. So as you could see when the animation ran, um, the queue items were processed a lot faster because now you have two robots doing the work of what used to be one robot. So it'll be done in our case in, let's say, 45 minutes. 
So that's an example of a case where you, if you have another robot machine, you want to change this number up here to, for example, two. And then you can actually go one level deeper and say, we don't want another job uh, triggered or created for each new queue item. If uh, we set this to 10, for example, that means that we need, in the first place, we need five items to be created for a trigger to fire at all, right? Now, if we had uh, a maximum number of simultaneous jobs set to two, and we added six queue items, then that would trigger two jobs to be created. But when we set this, uh, this third option, another job is triggered for each 10 items. That means that if you add eight items to the queue, for example, only one job is going to be created because we've just decided that one robot can handle up to 10 jobs before another robot sort of kicks in using this third option. So we're really in pretty good shape now, but I want to show you one more thing. What if we have two robots, each capable of running process A, and we have one queue, and these um, robots can you know, process those in about, let's say, 45 minutes. That's all great. But the process that feeds the queue is set to run at about 8 in the morning. And we know that it takes about 45 minutes to, for this to finish. And actually, we have another couple of processes, process B and process C, and we want those to be processed by robot 1 and robot 2, respectively, um, at about 8.30. That's going to be a problem because at 8.30, you know, machine uh, robot 1 and robot 2 are going to be busy processing um, the queue items. And those two uh, processes, B and C, they are time critical, more so than process A and the queue items that it sort of consumes. So how can we how can we uh, do something about that? Well, if we go into Orchestrator again, we can actually set this schedule ending of job execution down here. And we can set the job to stop after 30 minutes. Now, what will happen if we do this is that the job will simply stop. Both jobs will stop and they won't resume. Not going to happen. So if we go back to the illustration here, what will happen is these two will run, and then they'll simply stop. Nothing more. And then process B and C could start, and everything would be good, except we still need to process quite a few queue items for process A. So back in Orchestrator, we have one more option we can set. After completing jobs, reassess conditions and start new jobs if possible. If we set that and add the trigger, and imagine this is actually uh, the, the robots running. What would happen now is because process B and process C are scheduled to start at 8.30, they will run. And once they are done running, new jobs will have been created because we set this check mark for uh, process A or for that trigger. And so they will run and you know that will take uh, roughly 15 minutes or so. And then you'll have everything processed. So I know this is a little bit abstract and, and maybe a little bit complicated, but if you play around with it, it adds so much flexibility to how things can run. So if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. It really does make a lot of difference. And if you like the channel, subscribe to it and hit the notification bell so you'll be notified when I put out new videos. I don't do it that often, so it's not going to be annoying. So make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell, give it a like. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye.